Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, and not on my normal set. I'm standing next to a replica of the T-Rex specimen known as Stan. And yes, it's that much bigger than me. I'm about 1.8 meters tall. The hips of Stan go up to about 3.7 meters. I'm here to take you on a guided tour of the skeletal anatomy of T-Rex. And fortunately, that will be good for general tetrapod anatomy, since tetrapods all have about the same bones. First, we have to get our bearings. There are some anatomical terms that are very useful that you will probably want to know going forward. Anterior is the direction toward the front of the animal. Posterior is the direction towards the rear of the animal. Lateral is towards the side of the animal. Medial towards the center line, but sometimes means in the middle in some other way. For example, your medial phalange is the middle bone of a given finger. Distal is away from the body, and proximal is towards it. These words are most often applied to parts of limbs. These words can be combined. For example, T-Rex has a posteroventrally projecting ischium, that is the bone that goes down and towards the rear of the animal. Let's start at the anterior end of the animal with the skull. Then we have the spine, the shoulder girdle, and the pelvic girdle. Let's get a bit more detail on each of them. The skull is composed of the cranium and the jaw. The spine has four sections on most tetrapods. First is the cervical vertebrae that make up the animal's neck. The T-Rex has short cervical ribs, which are just what they sound like, ribs in the neck. Next we have the dorsal vertebrae. These make up the part of the spine around the torso. In mammals, they are divided into thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. But in most tetrapods, there is no such division and all the dorsal vertebrae have ribs. Next up, we have the sacral vertebrae. Dinosaurs tend to have a lot of these, and in fact, having more than three sacral vertebrae is one of the big clues that the animal you're looking at is a dinosaur. Lastly, we come to the caudal vertebrae, the tail bones. On to the shoulder girdle. T-Rex, like many more derived theropods, has a furcula, which is homologous to a human clavicle. This is the wishbone you may have broken at a Thanksgiving meal. It also has a scapula and a coracoid. Mammals don't have coracoids, but most other tetrapods do. When proceeding distally, we have the humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Next we come to the pelvic girdle, where we have the ilium, ischium, and pubis bones. Together, they make up the hip, and importantly in dinosaurs, they form a ring into which the femur is inserted to make the hip joint. That's a trait that's diagnostic for dinosaurs, and present in birds. We can see this if we just slide the leg bones out of there. The femur is next, and it also has some important diagnostic anatomy for dinosaurs. One important aspect is that the femoral head, the part of the femur that connects to the pelvis, is distinctly turned and offset from the rest of the bone. Most tetrapods don't have this condition, and it is what allows dinosaurs to have their legs go straight down instead of sprawling like a lizard. Mammals share this trait in a broad sense, but their pelvises don't work quite the same way, which is what you'd expect from convergent evolution of this trait. We also have what's called the fourth trochanter, which is diagnostic for archosaurs, and it is the site of attachment for a muscle called the caudofemoralis longus, which stretched from the proximal end of the femur to the anterior portion of the tail and served as the main retractor muscle for the femur, allowing the animal to walk. Birds retain this muscle, Although, since they don't move their femurs much, it's fairly small. Importantly, the fourth trochanter isn't symmetrical, which is diagnostic for dinosaurs. Going distally again, we get to the tibia and fibula, then the tarsals. The tarsals are important for dinosaurs, which you might know if you saw my video on crocodilians. They only articulate in one direction. Unlike human ankles, a dinosaur can only move the ankle up and down. No rotation or side-to-side -side motion. While this might seem like a bad thing, it helped the animals be more efficient walkers, even if they aren't as agile as they could have been. Like everything else in evolution, there's a trading game. Flexibility is usually expensive energetically, and can make an animal more prone to injury. You can be really flexible like a primate, 
but it'll take energy and you're going to get hurt. Then we get to the metatarsals, which in T-Rex are kind of smooshed together so they can't move relative to each other. And guess what? This loss of flexibility made walking more efficient once again. In fact, in modern dinosaurs, that is birds, the metatarsals are all fused together. Then we get to the phalanges, and one thing I want to point out is that the distal most phalanges are shaped like claws, and these are called ungules, which is the term for a bone that hosts a claw or hoof. In fact, ungulates, like horses and cows, are so called because they walk on their ungules. Primates don't really have ungules having traded claws for nails. Okay, onto the skull! Let's start with the cranium. The part that has the upper jaw, the nose, the eyes, the brain, you know, all that good stuff. Let's start with the various openings. Up first is the nares, which are the nose holes. Next we have the promaxillary fenestra, something many dinosaurs lack, but that is fairly common in theropods. You know, the two-legged bitey dinosaurs that include birds. Next up we have the antorbital fenestra, which is a diagnostic trait for archosaurs. Then we have the orbit. While it's not pictured here, the orbit would also have contained a ring of bones surrounding, supporting, and protecting the eye, called a sclerotic ring. Finally, we come to the two temporal fenestrae. These allowed muscles to go through the inside of the skull and attach from the cranium to the jaw. Also, the ventral or superior temporal fenestrae may have played a role in cooling the animal. The lateral temporal fenestrae can be seen in profile view and did not contain the ear. The ears were posterior to them and not encased in bone. Okay, let's look at the bones. First we have the premaxilla, the anterior most bone and one of the tooth-bearing bones. Then we have the nasal bone, and below that, the maxilla, another tooth-bearing bone. These three are the bones that border the nares. Then we have the lacrimal bone, which with the maxilla are the bones that border the andorbital fenestra. Next we have the prefrontal bone and the frontal bone, then the postorbital bone, Going down from here, we have the jugal bone. These bones, together with the lacrimal bone, form the border of the orbits. At the rear of the cranium, we have the parietal, the squamosal, the quadratojugal, and the quadrate bones. Going inside the mouth of the T-Rex, a place normally best avoided, we find the palatine bone, which forms the roof of the mouth and allowed dinosaurs to eat and breathe at the same time, another similarity to mammals beyond limb position. Now to the bitey part, the jaw. The jaw of T-Rex has two fenestrae, the mandibular and the serangular fenestra. As for bones, we have the dentary, which has teeth, and is homologous to the mammal jawbone. But the other bones in the jaw are not in mammals, because they turn them into ear bones. But they are the serangular, the angular, and the tiny articular bone. In this model, they are not terribly distinct, but here's a picture to help. Lastly, let's look at the gastralia. The sternum protects vital organs like the heart, and the gastralia or belly ribs help protect the gut and air sacs. Of course, there's a whole lot more to skeletal anatomy than we just went over, but this is just a quick introduction to major aspects of it. At least with this knowledge, you'll be in a good place to understand what scientific papers about dinosaur anatomy are talking about, and in fact, what papers about things besides dinosaurs are talking about. Well, that's all for today. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching. But before you go, I'd like to take some time to thank my patrons, especially my $20 and above patrons, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, and Bent Hovind. As you know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and my patrons give me much needed stability. If you'd like to join the team, there's a link in the description to my Patreon, which starts at $1. If you'd like, I also have a link to my Teespring store and an Amazon wishlist. <laughs> How would you tell people that this is you first person? How, How would you tell this? Well, if there's a question, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.